adventure not I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case open and shut no doubt about it I'm a nature nut today we'll go bird watching tomorrow we'll catch toads the next day we'll take photographs of bugs along the road I never get the feeling that I'm in a rut that's why I'm a nature nut well I'm a nature nut I'm not afraid to admit I'm wild about the wild things and I'm proud of it I'm just a simple case open and shut no doubt about it I'm a nature nut Dragonflies and damselflies are some of my favorite insects, and although just about everyone knows what they are, very few people can identify individual species, which is a terrible shame, because there are 5,000 or more species worldwide and over 400 in North America, which is a lot of dragonflies and a lot of damselflies. Now, dragonflies are great subjects for photography, and I keep thinking if I could get photographs of all the species that live on my home turf here in Alberta, I could make a nice little field guide. And you know, I mean, I might actually succeed in that. It'll take a couple of years. And if I don't, it's just a great excuse to hang around in places like this with my camera and the dragonflies. Oh, there's one I could use. That's one of the American bluets. Maybe I got it, maybe I'm the one who blew it. Some tropical damselflies eat spiders that they pluck from the centers of their webs. You know, rumor has it that there's a field guide to the dragonflies of North America in the works, but it's not on the shelves yet. So let me tell you a bit about the books that are available for identifying dragonflies. The first book that I got about dragonflies that got me interested in dragonflies was a free book called Les Libellules du Québec, and it's written in French. Fortunately, most of it uh, is actually, you know, Latin, Latinized French, so I was able to read it. It's the only thing I've ever read in French besides the back of cereal boxes, and it's actually quite a neat little book, nice wing diagrams. But unless you live in Quebec and can read French, it's not going to do you much good. Then I picked up this excellent three-volume set, The Odonata of Canada and Alaska, by Walker and Walker and Corbett. Very fine treatment of the fauna, but primarily written in entomological jargon, which most people will find a bit difficult, and illustrated primarily with pictures of, you know, genital claspers. So, in England, in the UK, they have at least three or four different field guides to their dragonflies with uh, color pictures in them. Go figure, color pictures, beautiful. Now this is the thing that we should have here in North America, but we don't yet, except for, oh, they're, they're just lovely. Except for two volumes by Sidney Dunkel, the damselflies of Florida, Bermuda, and the Bahamas, and dragonflies of the Florida Peninsula, Bermuda, and the Bahamas. And what uh, Dr. Dunkel has done is to illustrate these books with color photographs of living dragonflies and damselflies, and they are absolutely stunningly beautiful, and I've used them myself, and they work. The, the other great thing about them is that they work all the way up uh, the eastern side of North America, so uh, I guess people as far north as Wisconsin have found these books to uh, be usable for identifying their dragonflies. And you know, did you know that um, all dragonflies are to an extent solar powered? I'll just remove the cover from the panel there. It took me quite a few hours to build this model. I hope you appreciate it. Aren't they cute?
Well, we're just coming up to a little beaver pond here. There are seven species of these critters on the wing, which is nice and simple. It's a good place to start practicing our identification. And the first thing you have to do is sort out the dragonflies from the damselflies. Come on over here. This place should be a flutter with them. All right, so, yep, they're all here. Have a look at this thing. This is a dragonfly proper. It, uh, it has a fairly thick body. It, ha it holds the wings straight out to the sides. And it's, you know, it's a fairly heavy little critter. And the front wings are just a little bit slimmer than the hind wings. Dragonfly. Over here, these little guys. And among the grass, there's one there, a nice beautiful male. That's a damselfly. The damselfly is a much slimmer creature. It's almost T-shaped. The eyes just come out to the side and the body just comes out behind. And the wings are either held flat over the back or out at a bit of an angle, but never straight out like an airplane. So once you've got your dragonflies and your damselflies separate, then you can start distinguishing groups within those two subgroups, the different sorts of dragonflies, like the darners that are cruising around over the pond. And Oh, and by the way, you know, there, there is a movement afoot to create standard English names, common names, for the dragonflies of North America, so that, you know, instead of calling this Leucorhinia hudsonica, you would call it uh, some kind of white-faced skimmer. And this damselfly, instead of calling it Cenagrion resolutum, you would call it some sort of Eurasian bluet. I don't know the the names yet because they haven't been published yet, these, these official names. There's also another movement afoot to suppress that and to force us to use the Latin names. But pff, to that, I figure let's learn them both and then we'll all be happy. Why not? Anyway, there's, there you have it. Dragonflies, damselflies, the beginning of a successful career identifying these creatures. And the combined term, some people want to call them all dragonflies, gets very confusing. You have to use a little bit of entomological jargon. We call them odinata, or odinates. A couple of odinates in the grass here, yes. I know dragonfly watching is a great thing to do, and you can do it with binoculars. It's, it's easy, it works, but no binocular in the world can focus quite that closely. I use these uh, 7 by 26 Bosch and Loam Customs. Now that's about the nicest dragonfly watching binocular you can get. But any, I mean any binocular will do. But these are just particularly good because first of all the 7 power binocular has a wild, wide, not a wild field of view. I mean everything you see with it will be wild, but it's a wide field of view. And they also focus very closely. For example this emerald here, it's less than 2 meters away and I can still get it in perfect focus. Look at the eyes on that critter. Wow. Some dragonflies eat mostly other dragonflies. Now another thing you can do to make your dragonfly watching even more interesting is to mark individual dragonflies. You catch them carefully without hurting them. Get yourself a waterproof felt pen. This is a laundry pen. And uh, then very gently expose the wing. Give it a little mark that you can recognize. You can invent a system so you can recognize all sorts of dragonflies out there. And then you just let your little creature go and this female can go back about her business at the beaver pond. There she goes. Oh, should have given her a name first. Oh well, we'll still recognize her. The one with the little mark on the left forewing. I think that's right. Left, I mean. Fossil dragonflies from before the age of dinosaurs had wings as long as a crow's. find I can usually identify them with binoculars. Sometimes you have to catch them though, just to confirm the identification. You can let them go, but catching them is not easy. You have to be very sneaky, kind of like a nature ninja. You know, return of the dragon. Fly.
You don't have to catch these things to appreciate them, and in fact, you don't have to be terribly active at all yourself while you do that. But you will notice right off the bat that there are lots of things going on. They're spending most of their time looking for food and for mates, and by food, I mean little bugs. The dragonflies will generally catch their food in midair and eat it in midair. Damselflies pluck it right off the leaves of plants, and then uh, they'll alight chew up their little meals. The, um, among the dragonflies as well, you'll notice some of them are almost always on the wing. Patrolling species like the darners, very difficult to watch because they're always moving and hard to keep in focus. While others will perch on a twig or a branch or a leaf and dart out from that perch and they'll spend most of the time in one place so you can get a real good look at them. Some of them have territory, some of them hold territories for just a short period, some for a long period, but they're always on the lookout, those territorial males, for a mate. Dragonflies were the first flying predators on Earth, long before birds, bats, and pterosaurs. Dragonfly, damselfly mating system is one of the weirdest in the insect world, and the insect world is full of weird mating systems. What happens here, the, uh, the male grasps the female with his clasping appendages on the end of the abdomen by either the neck, in the case of damselflies, or by the back of the eyeballs, in the case of dragonflies, and uh, then the female reaches around with her abdomen to collect the sperm and they form a sort of a wheel. It actually looks like a little heart, quite cute. And then they go off to uh, deposit the eggs and while they're doing that, the good thing is they're both pointing in the same direction so they can fly together. You know, it's quite different from butterflies, things like that where they mate end to end and if they both tried to fly at once, they'd pull each other apart. Terrible. At this point, they have to find a place to lay the eggs, and that's what's happening here now. Now, many dragonflies, the pairs will just fly over the water and just throw the eggs in the water, just dip the abdomen, and in they go. Very simple system. flies on the other hand and some of the dragonflies they actually lay the eggs inside a plant stem sometimes the females will uh, will lay them above the water line these ones are going either right under the water or at least sticking the tip of the abdomen under the males remain attached because they don't want other males to disturb the process and mate with the females themselves, and the other males want nothing more than to mate with the females and disturb the process. So it's a very tense time for these little damselflies, as you can see. You know, sometimes you get so many females laying eggs that they can actually kill the water plants. A spot like this, it's a major damselfly incubator. The larvae of some damselflies live in pools of water inside air plants high on the sides of tropical trees. Be 
candy kind of grin around, be a little dragonfly. Red on top with a racing stripe and a sparkle in my compound eye. And if I had to live in any kind of place, I'd live by a beaver pond. Lie around the rushes and the willowy shrub, then off to the hill beyond. And flip to the right, put it in reverse, and then you're up sideways. You zig over here, and you zag over there, and you got a lovely dinner in the middle of the air. And dragon fly. If I had wings, I'd want four, strong with plenty of veins. Flapping like crazy, fly around fast, make myself dizzy in the brains. Up in the sky, down among the grass, and over from the meadow, the trees. Chasing after anything smaller than me, especially wasps and bees. Dragonflies in the sky. You put it to the left and you put it to the right. You put it in the first and you put it when you take over here and you take over there. When you got one finger in the middle of the air. Pop them in mouth, swallow them just like that. If only they lived in one kind of season, I'd pick summer for sure. Enjoying the less green scenery and the agreeable temperature. Dragonflies, when they are young, when they are babies after they hatch out from the egg. Of course, they don't have wings quite yet. They begin life as a nymph, or more properly, a larva. I've got some larvae in here. Have a look. Larvae in here, pardon me. It gets kind of complicated, but whatever you say, it'll be all right. This long, skinny one with the leafy things off the back end, that's a damselfly larva. And the long, leafy things are its gills. That's what it breathes through. The dragonfly larvae, on the other hand, like this uh, sleek-looking darner dragonfly larva, or these kind of crud-covered skimmer dragonfly larvae, they have their gills within the rectum. And in order to breathe, they bring water into the rectum and they expel water out of the rectum. And if they need to get away in a hurry, they expel the water very quickly and they just go boom through the water. It's a kind of a jet-propelled system. Very cool indeed. But uh, the neatest thing about them, and they're not doing it right now, is that they, uh, they feed with their lower lip. Imagine this appendage is my lower lip. A dragonfly larva folds its lower lip under its chin and then shoots it out with little grabbers on the end, brings its prey back in and munches it up. Very interesting indeed. Now, if you keep dragonfly or damselfly larvae in a tank like this, make sure to put a stick in because eventually they'll want to climb up the stick and become adults, and if they don't have a stick, they can't get out. This is a pretty good design, this aquarium, because they can choose the water depth that they prefer. They seem to be enjoying the deep end today. My name is Natasha Klanksch, and I'm the summer student at the Wagner Natural Area. Uh, one of the jobs that I was given was to choose a research project, and the one that I chose was to study dragonflies. 
Since I've started, I've found about 12 to 15 different species, and I can recognize about 10 of them just on sight alone. And they're beautiful. I found blue ones, black ones, red ones, green ones, yellow ones, and all sorts of different shapes and sizes. Um, it's hard trying to catch them. You've got to sneak up behind them with the net as quietly as you can. And then if you're lucky, you'll take a swipe at them and they'll end up in your net. And then you've got to identify them. That's a little harder. Uh, I usually end up holding them by the wings and taking out the hand lens and try to figure out what their claspers look at, like, what's their exact shape. And, and I have to struggle through these technical terms. I have this key that was also given to me by John Acorn. And uh, I'm learning all these wonderful new Latin names for things. This work is just fascinating, and I find it very rewarding. Um, for instance, today I found a new species. This is the third sighting of the species in Alberta. And it's a beautiful one. It's, uh, it's a kind of a sh uh, schnura, and it's a lovely black and blue color with green eyes. It's a long, thin, delicate-looking damselfly. You're almost afraid of hurting it when you're holding it. And just finding a species like that makes it all worthwhile. There are very few people anywhere doing any work with dragonflies. In fact, I'm the only one that's collecting dragonflies in the Wagner Natural Area, which is kind of nice because there's no competition for the data. Mind you, it does get a little lonely out here sometimes. You know, I could do this all day, and I probably will, but that's, that's all the time we've got for now. I should tell you, though, the dragon, the rare damselfly that Natasha found, it turned out to be not just the third record of Ishnura from Alberta, the fork tails, but the first record of Ishnura damula, a whole new species for the province. Go figure. If you get into dragonfly and damselfly watching, you'll find it's not as easy as bird watching because the field guides aren't there, but it's much more interesting because you discover new things and you blaze a path. That, in part, is why I'm a nature nut. And I hope you are too. See you later. Same time each and every week, uncensored and uncut. No doubt about it, I'm a nature nut.